We'll start in verse number one. The Bible says, In the seventh month, on in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the mm -hmm. word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, and he's starting to, and then he's going to prophesy all these things to the people there. And we're going to go into it. Now, we're going to be in Ezra, and we're also going to be in Joshua quite a bit. And then some in the Gospels. So if you want to make your way over to Ezra chapter number 3, and we'll talk about uh, what's going on here. The Bible says, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes this comparison of, as, of, as, of it as nothing? So right here, God is telling through the prophet Haggai to the people, he said, who here saw the first temple? And obviously the Bible says in the book of uh, Ezra, where we're going to go, there were ancients, there were old people that had seen the first temple while it was still standing. Now it's destroyed and they're rebuilding the temple and God is wanting them to make a comparison between the old temple and the new temple. Now, I heard a sermon a long time ago called the Old Temple versus the New Temple, and it was basically glorifying and exalting prophets of the past, saying that what happened in the past can never be redone. And it's talking about the Old Temple was better than the New Temple. But I'm going to tell you this, the New Temple was better than the Old Temple. And I'll explain that later on. God even just comes out and says that. <clears throat> and he's kind of rebuking him, saying, is it not in your eyes as a comparison of it as nothing? He's saying, why are you taking this like you're looking at this temple and you're saying it's like nothing? They're not excited about it. They weren't, they weren't as excited as God would have them to be. Now, go to Ezra chapter number three. God was going to do a great work through the people that came back into Judah. But the problem was is that they didn't value the work that God was going to give them. They were looking at this new temple and there was many of them that were shouting for joy, the youth. We're saying, wow, this great new temple, they were singing praises to God and they were shouting and they were glorifying God. But there were a bunch of people that were older people that had seen the old temple and they were not as excited about the new temple. They were not as, as uh, zealous about the new temple. They were kind of living in the days of the past. And the Bible is saying right here that they didn't value the new temple, this new temple that God was going to have them build. God is saying, compare these two temples. Now go to Ezra chapter three, look at verse number 11. And they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord, because he is good for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout, and they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. So just the foundations being laid right here. And this is exactly where he's talking about the foundation being laid in, in the book of Haggai. Look at verse 12. But many of the priests and the Levites and the chief of the fathers, who were ancient men, that had seen the first house, when the foundation of this house is laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people, for the people sh with, shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. Now go in your Bibles to Joshua chapter number 1. Joshua chapter number 1. The Bible says that the old man that had seen the old temple, when they seen the first temple, the foundation of it was being laid, they cried and they wept and they longed for the old temple. But the Bible is going to tell us that they should not have been desirous of this old temple because the old temple was destroyed. The old temple was done away with and the reason why the old temple was done away with was because of sin. Because they went into sin, they went into idolatry, they forsook the Lord and therefore God allowed this temple to be destroyed. Now God is bringing in a new crop of people, a new generation of people to rebuild this temple. Now you say, well, how can we apply this to us today? Well, let me tell you this. We have an old IFB movement in this country. Yeah. And for the same reason that old temple was destroyed, it's going to waste as well because of sin, because of compromise, yeah. because of false Bible versions, because of idolatry, because of a bunch of garbage. And the new temple is being rebuilt in this world right now. I used to think that the new temple of this new IFB movement was only in America. But you know what? I believe this. I really believe we're in the living in the last times. I believe we are going to be making a surge in the next 20 or 30 years into the final hurrah of Christianity before Christ comes back. And you know what? I believe this. We can glorify and, and people can sit there and, and talk about the, the prophets and preachers of the 1900s, but they don't hold a candle to the guys that are coming, that are coming after us. Amen. I believe this. There are going to be preachers that are going to arise. Our children... 
that are going to rise in the next 20 and 30 years, and they're going to be preaching with more might and more power than we can even fathom. And you know what? What's going to happen is there's going to be, a, there is today, a bunch of preachers that have seen this old IFB movement, and when they see the foundations of what's going on now, do you know what they do? They cry and they weep. They want to fight and they want to rebel against it instead of embracing it. And they can't sit there and say, well, you guys are getting a bunch of people saved. You're out there preaching the gospel to millions of people. You guys are getting the word of God. You're promoting the King James Bible. And they just want to get hung up on a bunch of extra biblical things. And you know why? It's because they've seen this old temple. And the old temple, my friend, is gone. It's done away with. The Bible says you cannot put a piece of new cloth on an old garment, my friend. And God is not going to rebuild this old, this old IFB movement. He's not, you know, we're not sprouting and rebuilding and repopulating these old churches, my friend. They're going by the wayside. And I believe that that's the way that God would have it. God wants there to arise brand new churches. Not re- revamping old churches. Not preaching yeah. to the dead bones of the IFB movement. Amen. But brand new bones. Brand new churches. Brand new life. That's the way that God would have it. Right, now go in your Bibles. Go to, I told you go to Joshua chapter 1. Go back to Haggai 2. Hold your finger in Joshua 1. <clears throat> They want to glory and they talk about, and every time I have downloaded or every time I have listened to one of these preachers, you know, I'll just check out, see what they're saying. We got Tony Hudson's. We have these people that were just known for, they're like very well known in the regular cookie cutter IFB movement of today. They can't, sermon doesn't go by when they don't talk about some pastor from 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. Their sermon doesn't go yeah. by when they don't reference how great it was when they were a little kid. But let me tell you, my friend, those days are long gone. Those days, you can sit there and weep, and they, they, they'll criticize the new foundation. They'll criticize the new temple. But they themselves are just clinging to something that's been destroyed by God. I believe this. They compromised, and God let them go down the road of compromise. They are being filled with the fruit of their own hands. With the, they're, being, they're, just, they're eating it up. That's what you want. That's what you're going to get. You want the Bible college mentality of you just follow the Bible college. You follow your alma mater right into compromise and sin. God said, okay, you go ahead and do that. You let that temple be destroyed. I'm going to raise up a new temple. Now, you think about the, you think about the preachers of the 1900s. And I'm going to name for you some guys, which if you have been, who in here has been to IFB, like a regular IFB type church before? Many, many people. These are people that you've heard their names. And I, want, I want people to name for me the churches that these guys started these guys had, and what city their churches are in. You don't have to say it out, it's kind of rhetorical, but I'm telling you what, nobody's going to be able to, other than, you know, Jack House. John R. Rice, what church did he come from? Lester Roloff, R.G. Lee, Lee Robertson, Curtis Hudson, uh, B.R. Lakin. Where are all these guys' churches? And I bet people in here have no clue. And you know what? Their churches are gone, their churches are dead, and their churches are liberal after one generation. They're gone. We can't sit there in glory and sit there and, you know, pray for the spirit of R.G. Lee and Lee Robertson to come upon us, the spirit of Curtis Hudson. <laughs> Is that's not what we're praying for. You know what? We're praying for the spirit of God to come upon this. I said again, God is not going to put a piece of new cloth on an old garment yeah. because the rent is going to be made worse. Right. He's not going to cast his pearls before swine. Yes. You know what he's going to do? He's going to say, you know what? I'm going to let that movement go in, the, go in one direction and I'm going to raise up brand new people. And every new generation that comes along is always hated on by the previous generation of preachers. Yeah. When the IFB movement in America started coming along, what happened? The Southern Baptist Convention type preachers, all people got mad at them for, for soul winning and for all their, their exploits that they were doing. And they hated on them. And now you have the same guys that were saying, hey, these people were hating on us when we were young guys, when we were coming out and we were zealous about God. Now they're turning around and doing the same exact thing. Now they're hating on people that are rising up that want to do great things for God, just criticizing them really basically over personality disputes. You know, I was in a church where the pastor at the time did not know that Pastor Anderson was a pre-trib. Our post trip, he thought that he's pre. He thought basically that Pastor Anderson him believed doctrinally identical, but you know what he said? Well, he prayed for Obama to die, and I was like, "That's all you got? You're gonna hate this guy because he prayed for Obama to die? <laughs> Obama was a wicked, ungodly person." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, "I mean, he's a he's pro partial birth abortion. I mean, he's pro everything that's wicked. He's a, as liberal as they've ever came. I mean, he's a wicked, ungodly person. And that's all you got." And you know what? You know what it was? Is they were just going to find something. They're going to find something, a reason to resist, a reason to weep, a reason to say, well, he's not like Brother Hiles. He's not like R.G. Lee. 
He's not like BR. Like, you hear these names, and it's like, who, who are these people? <laughs> and honestly, I'll, I'll tell you what, my friend. They may have done great things for God. Thank God for these people if they're saved, that, that they've done, the things that they've done for God. But I've listened to their sermons, and I'll be honest with you, they're pretty watered down. I mean, I, I mean that's, that's a fact. They may preach some good points and have good principles, but when you listen to the sermon, it's literally, that's where you wonder why these preachers are preaching four and five verses a week. It's because their preacher that they came from preached four and five verses a week. Yeah, yeah. You listen to the preaching classes that come out of Verity or Faithful Word or, or even here. Yeah. And they have 20 verses in a 15-minute sermon. Amen. Why? Because there, everything brings forth after its own kind. That's right. Look, the apple didn't fall that far from the tree. Yeah. But that was in a day before the internet, before things can really be verified. You know, does that make any sense? Yeah. I remember listening to Jeff Owens. And I remember listening to like these old sermons when he was uh, when he's preaching really to a bunch of kids at Bible college and everything. Man, this guy tears it up. He's a you know awesome preacher. And then I heard that he was a pastor, so I went on his church website and downloaded sermons, just watered down sermon after watered down sermon, twenty five minute sermon after twenty five minute sermon. You see why? Because it was all for show. They're only putting the things out there that look good. Yeah. Yep. But the things that they do on a daily basis are very weak. They're very shallow. That old temple is done away with for a reason. Mm -hmm. If they were on fire, then God wouldn't have let it fall apart. Yep. But it has fallen right. apart. It's went in the way of all the liberalism. The things that the liberals were saying about them in the 19, in 1990s are the same things that they're saying about us right now. Yeah. They're saying, oh, you're turning people away. You know, oh, you're, you're preaching hard. You're just turning people away. How are these homos going to get saved? All this. <laughs> Look, I, I found, a, I found a, a, a sermon that somebody emailed me from Bob Gray Sr. in 1998, and he's sitting there ripping on the homos. I mean, he's calling them fags and queers. And he even said, look, I mean, in the old times, they used to call them fags and queers. Now they're saying that it's genetic and they're born that way. Ooh, eat your words, Bob Gray. Yeah. Because now he is, he was preaching about the Valley of Dry Bones. Bob Gray's become dry bones. Yeah. He may have done great things back then, but he's fell down that slippery slope of compromise. And God is not going to revive those things. He's going to bring up and rise up another generation. Now, the Bible says, so look at Haggai 2, verse number 9. The Bible says, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. The Bible says the latter house, they already just, they just had the foundation. The Bible says once this temple, this new temple is built, it's going to be by far greater. The glory is going to be greater than the old temple. But the people were weeping. They didn't want to hear that. Now go to Joshua chapter number one. Joshua chapter number one. Now there may have been men that have done great things for God and his kingdom, but I believe this new generation of Baptists are the answer for this country today. They're the answer. What's going on right now? Look, this is not just for entertainment purposes. I really and truly believe that this movement, this push that's going on in the United States right now is something that's going to affect the entire world. And I believe that, I really truly believe this is the last, one of the last pushes for Christianity. The Bible says in the end of the world, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all nations and all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. Before the final, before the end comes, the gospel is going to be preached to every single person in the world. And I was sitting there listening to Pastor Anderson on, on a Friday. We started talking with Brother Fan and I. And he was giving us his, his breakdown of, you know, evangelizing the entire world. And I remember sitting there thinking to myself, like, this is it. This is it. I mean, I really believe that. You guys right now are a part of or can be a part of and I can be a part of the last push. The Bible talks about in Daniel. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. You can be those people. But it really, it's a decision that you have to make. Mm -hmm. You say, well, do I, what if I'm, I don't, do I have to be a pastor to do that? I think you should. But even if you're not, just being a part of a great church, that's how it's going to get done. Not by being a Facebook, not by being a YouTube watcher, yeah, but by on. sitting your butt in a fundamental Baptist church, by going out there soul winning, by going out there preaching the gospel, yeah. not just three or four soul winning marathons a year, but week in and week out, that's how you're going to do great exploits. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's going to happen. And that's what it's going to take. But that's what God has raised up this new temple. This is new temple Baptist church. And you know what? God is going to bless it and it's going to be greater greater in might than the former. Now, what do we need to be able to rebuild? Look at Haggai. I know you're in Joshua 1. We're going to get there in just a second. Go to Haggai chapter 2, verse number 4. We need to be fearless and strong. We need to be brave. 
Because as we get closer to the end, the persecution arises. So therefore, we need to be more fearless and stronger than ever. We need to be braver and more courageous than ever. Look at verse number two, four. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and be strong, O ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work. For I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I coveted with you when you came, for, when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. Now go to Joshua 1. Every time you notice in the Bible there's a transition in history where one torch is being passed to another, or one, uh, you know, like, Something is this, there's a transition in power or in the way something is going. God always comes and tells the person that's taking over to be strong and fear not. I'll give you an example. Look at Joshua 1.1. 1, 1. Every time there's a change from one stage to another, God always comes in and says, I know you're doing something. You're starting something new. You need to be strong and you need to be fearless. Look at verse 1. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over, the, go over this Jordan and, and all this people into the land which I do give to them, even to all the children of Israel. Now God didn't say, well, Joshua, the, your best days are behind you, buddy. You know, good luck. I mean, sit there, Joshua, and go to all the people and just reminisce about, about Moses and reminisce about all the things that happened. Do you know what he said? Hey, Moses is dead, Joshua. It's done. Now it's time to rise up and go across the Jordan. Now, therefore, now, therefore, not sit around and mourn, not sit around and weep, not sit around and reminisce, but now, therefore, arise. It's time to go over Jordan. It's time to go to the promised land. To the day you were waiting for that I talked about, that Moses talked about, that day's come. And that's, look at verse number five. And there, shall not, and there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage. For unto this people shalt divide inheritance for the land, of the, for, an, for an inheritance of the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous. That thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. That thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Hold your finger in Joshua and go to Luke chapter number 12. Hold your finger in Joshua because we're coming back and go to Luke chapter number 12. <coughs> Every time there's a switch in stages. David is getting ready to die. He's very old. He's patching, passing the torch to his son Solomon. I'll just read it for you. 1 Kings 2, 1. Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. We need to catch the vision of doing great things for God, and that starts with us catching the vision to be fearless, to be courageous. And look, it's easy when you're in church. It's easy right now as we speak. I mean, we don't really, the persecution we go under in this country is, is very minimal, my friend. Yeah. But I'm telling you the days are coming. Joshua was standing there and he's telling Joshua to be strong because the days that are in front of him are going to be his most glorious days, but they're also going to be days filled with battle. They're going to be days that he needs to be courageous. But if, he, if Joshua had an opportunity to be afraid, it's going to be in the future. And God tells him over and over and over, Joshua 1, be fearless, be fearless, don't be afraid. Same thing happened. The whole time Jesus is ministry in the Gospels, he's preaching to his disciples, he's kept telling him over and over, be not afraid, fear not them. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul and hell. He's telling his disciples, be, don't be afraid. They're going to kill you. And then he also gives us a mention about in the end times, when they come to get you, they're going to think they're doing the work of God, but don't be afraid. Look at verse number 7, Luke 12, 7. Even the very has a head of your hair, excuse me, even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Look at verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I mean, over and over he's telling them, fear not, fear not, don't be afraid. Why? Because there's going to be a transition there. Jesus Christ is going to be glorified. He's going to ascend up to heaven. He's going to hand the ball to his disciples. And now they are going to go into the world and turn the whole world upside down. But one thing that they needed to have is a lack of fear. No, no, just be courageous. Because fear spreads. Yeah. Fear is yeah, something that if one person is afraid, it makes other people afraid. 
And what happened is in the book of Numbers, when the two spies, or the 12 spies went into the land, Joshua and Caleb came back with a good report, and all they had to say is the land was exactly like God said. God said it would be flowing with milk and honey. They bring back clusters of grapes. They said it's great. They said, yeah, the people are big, but guess what? We have a bigger God. Amen. And they went there, and the, other, the 10 spies came back. They gave an evil report, and they struck fear into the hearts of all the people. And we don't need people in this movement that are going to be afraid. We need you to gird up your loins like, the, like, David, like David said to Solomon and, and quit ye like men and show yourself a man. And be strong and be ready for when the, the persecution comes. Because I'm telling you what, I hate to be doom and gloom, but the persecution is coming. If we are going to do great things for God, even here in Fort Worth, Texas, the persecution is going to come here. It's just a fact. We've, gotten, we've had a little taste of it, but I'm telling you what, the best is yet to come. You know what I'm saying? Go, to, go back to Haggai chapter number two. Hope you still have your finger in Joshua. So what do we need to get out of our, our life? Get out of our life? We need to get fear in, in, out of our life. We need to be filled with courage. We need to be filled with bravery. Fear is what stopped them from building the temple in the first place. They came back to build. The people sent letters. We read it in Haggai 1, and then we read it in, in, Ez, in Ezra. They sent letters to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the king, and he came back and said, stop building, and they just stopped building. Stopped building for years. Until Darius came along, and then he authorized the building again. And God told him, it doesn't matter what Darius says. You start building. And they said, who gave you this authority to start building? God gave us the authority. And they kept building because they weren't afraid of the people no more. Now they're afraid of God. And they said, look, God came down, and he exercised great power and showed us that if we fear people and not him, he'll take us into bondage. If we're going to be afraid of what they'll do to us, he'll make sure that happens. Yep. If we're afraid, right. yeah. well, we're afraid they'll take us and they'll, they'll arrest us and throw us in jail. And because they're afraid that would happen, he just said, okay, well, that's what you're going to get. The thing that thou fearest, it's come upon them. You know what I mean? And the Bible says if they would have feared God and done what God told them to do, that wouldn't have happened. They wouldn't have went into idolatry, and God would have protected them. Now you guys are in Haggai 2. What's the next thing we need to do? We need to get the sin and the worldliness out of our life because that will hinder the work. Look at verse number 11, Haggai 2, 11. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, ask the priest now concerning the law, saying... If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and with the skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priest answered and said, no. Then said Haggai, if one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, it shall be unclean. Then answered Haggai and said, so is this people, and so is this nation before me, saith the Lord. And so is every work of their hands, and which that they offer is unclean. You know what he's saying? Look, you got a bunch of work to do, but you're, you're unclean right now. And everything, you're, 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 you're filled with worldliness, you're filled with sin. In order for this thing to be successful, you have to get the sin out of your life. Now, you guys are, go to Malachi chapter number one. Malachi one. The Bible is saying that if God wanted to bless them in their work, they had to be clean. They had to be separate from the unclean thing. It's saying in verse number one, if one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment and it did touch bread, it doesn't make it holy. It's saying if you're wearing something that's clean and you touch an unclean, it doesn't make the unclean clean again. And it's saying if you touch something that's unclean to a clean thing, it doesn't make the clean, it makes the clean thing unclean. Unclean plus clean equals unclean. Yeah. You get that? Yeah. Yes. Clean plus unclean equals unclean. Yeah. If you touch the unclean, you become unclean. The Bible says that we should be separate, saith the Lord, and touch, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Why? Because if we touch the unclean thing, it don't become clean. We become unclean. God requires that we be separated. Why? Because we have a great work to do. Look down at Malachi 1, verse number 7. Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and ye say, Wherein have we polluted thee? In that ye say, The table of the Lord is contemptible. And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer now to thy governor, will he be pleased with thee? Or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts. The Bible is saying right there that the people were doing more better, they were doing put more into their, their worldly efforts and than they were for God. The things that they were offering and giving to God, if they were giving them to the world, the world wouldn't even accept it. You know what that means? How much do you read your Bible? How much do you pray? How much do you go so many? How much do you think about the things of God? If you put that much time and effort into your job, they'd fire you is what he's saying. But you are so worried about the things that this are talking about losing your job, you need to be worried about God looking down and taking away his power from your life. 
The Bible's saying right there that not every offering that people can give, that God's just happy with it. Yeah. The Bible says that God did not have respect to Cain's offering. Right off the bat, in Genesis chapter 4, we see God not accepting someone's offering. And people have this idea in 2017 that God just it doesn't care. As long as people are just giving things with a sincere heart, that God's okay with it. God's not okay with it. He wants it done His way. Amen. His way or the highway. That's right. And it's yeah. still like that. If God said, this is the way, this is how I want it done. Look, in the Old Testament, when they bring their offering, they had to bring certain types of animals. It couldn't just be, you know, they couldn't just say, okay, well, I have 100 sheep. I'm going to pick the worst one and bring it. They had to bring the best. Why? Because that's what God wants. God wants your best. God wanted their best, and he would take nothing less. Go to Haggai chapter 2. God said that in Haggai, the people didn't, that didn't work, had to be, they had to be separated and have their work blessed by God. If they wanted to work, they had to be separated. They'd be blessed by God. If they went back into the same sin, he's preaching through Haggai and through the prophets, they would be dealt with in the same manner except more severely. And we'll see that. They went back into the same exact sin and they ended up in more severely punished to the fact where God dis, completely disowned the physical nation of Israel. Now there is no physical nation where God looks down and blesses. There's no more physical. Do you know who God, do you know the, the people of God are? The believers, the spiritual nation, a holy priesthood, a spiritual priesthood. Why? Because of these people. Because they disobeyed. Now go in your Bibles to Haggai 2, look at verse number 16. Since those days were when one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. And when one came to the press fat for to draw 50 vessels out of the press, there were but 20. I smote you with blasting and with mildew and with hail and all the labors of your hands. Yet you turn not to me, saith the Lord. So God is saying right there in Haggai 2, he's saying, look, I punished you severely last time. Last time you guys did this, I devastated your whole life. I took you, I bring a foreign invader come in and you guys got taken into captivity. And he's saying, I did that. Nebuchadnezzar, yeah, he did that. But the Bible says in Jeremiah, Nebuchadnezzar was my servant. He was the tool that I used to do that to you guys. He said, I'll do it again. Now go back to Joshua chapter number one. Joshua is one. Now the, the term fear not and be very courageous is always coupled with keeping the commands of God. Because God saying fear not, I'm going to protect you, is not this carte blanche to just do whatever you want. A fear not and being protected by God is kind of an if-then thing. If you do this, I'll protect you. If you do this, I'll make you can be If you do this... You can be courageous and you can be zealous and know that I'm going to be there for you and I'm going to protect you. If you don't, then you should fear and you should be very afraid because I'll come in and I will rain up and cloud on you. Now I'll read for you 1 Kings chapter 2 verse number 3. Right after Joshua tells or excuse me, David tells Solomon to fear to fear not and be and be a man. He says, "And keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies." I mean, how many times are you going to say it? I mean, he said to keep the charge, to walk in his ways, to keep the statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest. You want to be prosperous in the work of God? It goes hand in hand with keeping the commands of God. Look at Joshua 1.8. So in verse 1, 7 and one, in chapter 1, 5 through 8, through 7, he's talking about fear, fear not, fear not, be courageous, be very courageous. Look at verse 8 though. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do all according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. The, prosper, the prosperity and the success doesn't come unless somebody is meditating on the words of the, of the Bible. And they're on day and night, keeping the commands of God. Go to Joshua chapter number 7. Go to Joshua chapter number 7. So they go in, they destroy, Jer God destroys Jericho. The Bible says that the walls came down flat. They walked straight way in front. They circled it, the walls came down, every man just marched forward right in. They destroyed a walled city, which is a, is a huge feat. Because you're not even really supposed to attack a walled city. Because it's just you starve them out. Because attacking the walled city is just that. You're attacking something that they have built for a purpose of just withholding, a stronghold. But because God blessed them, they didn't even have to fight. They just obeyed God, and God, the Bible even said the, the battle is the Lord's. And he came in there, he destroyed. Then, they go to Ai, and with a, with a, a very small force they were, that they were facing, defeated them. 
And it's not because of anything other than they had sin in the camp. And we'll read it. Look at verse number one. They were beat. God's hand of protection was off of them. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, took, a, took of the accursed thing. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Look at verse 3. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not the, all the people go up. So they're going to go. So they go into Jericho and they're told not to take anything. Everything is to be off limits. They're not allowed to have anything. But Achan takes something, this man. So now they're going to go into another battle. They have sin in the camp and they don't even know it. They're going to go into battle against Ai, and Ai is a much smaller force where they should really just be able just to walk all over him. Not a big deal. They even say, look, let's hold back some troops so that way, because we don't even need that many troops. It's kind of like if there's two guys and we have 100 guys to go fist fight. It's like, well, we don't even need that. Just send a few guys. You know what I mean? Look at verse number four. So there went up thither of the people about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. So they have 3,000 guys going up against Ai, and they get turned to flight. They get chased away. And the men of Ai smote them, about 30 and 6 men, for they chased them from before the gate, even unto Sherebim, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the heart of the people melted, and it became as water. So the people, they were defeated. The Bible says if God's on your side, one man can turn to flight 10,000. But the opposite is true too. If you are not in, if you are in sin and you try to do some great thing for God, the Bible says that God can cause them to over, overtake you. He cause them over. Look, I've heard people say, well, they got prideful. Israel got prideful and they thought they could take Ai out with the small force. So they went out there with the small force. That's not where they got t taken. They could have went out there with every single soldier they had. They could have went out there with a million people and they would have lost. Why? Because God was not blessing them because of sin. Look at verse 11. Israel has sinned and they have transgressed my covenant which I commanded them for they have even taken of the accursed thing and have also stolen and dissembled also. And they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemy but turned their back before their enemies because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore, except you destroy the accursed thing from among you. So in order to keep sin out of the camp, they had to take some drastic measures. And this is what they did. Look at verse number 13. Up, sanctify the people, and sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel, that thou, cannot, thou canst not stand before thine enemies until thou take away the accursed thing from among you. So Joshua gets up and says, Look, we're not going to be able, there's no reason even fighting anymore. There's no reason even doing anything because we have sin in the camp. We need to get the sin out of the camp or else we're just, we're just banging our heads against a wall. It's just going to mean more people are going to be killed because God is not only not with us, he's going to be against us. He's not going to let us, he won't let us win. Look at verse number 24. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah. So they find that Achan is the one that took it. Now look what they did to Achan. I mean, look how severe this punishment was. It says there in the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them into the valley of Acre. So they literally get, jo they get Achan, his wife, children, everything, every, everything that he has. And they bring it all out. And Joshua said, why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee in this day. Thee this day, and all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burnt them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. So who got stoned with stones? Was it just Achan? The whole family got stoned with stones. I believe the animal, everything got stoned with stones. And it says, and they, they stoned them, and then they burned them with fire. They stoned them to death. They killed them to death. You know what I mean? <laughs> and then they burned them up. And, and do you know what it was? It's a sign saying, look, this is what, this is what God thinks of sin in the camp. This is what God thinks. That one man's sin, that wedge of gold, that Babylonian garment, whatever, not Babylonian, that garment that he found cost 32 men their lives. And it could have easily cost the whole nation to be, to be taken back and pushed back because of one man's sin. Go to Ezra chapter number 9. See, they need to be fearless, but they also needed to get sin out of the camp. And the Bible says in the book of Haggai, they were in a transitional period where they came back into Judah and they're getting ready to go to another stage of their, of their lives. And he told them, look, 
If you go back into sin, the punishment is going to be very similar, but it's going to be more severe. And it's going to be more uh, lasting. <clears throat> I'll take you back into captivity, and you won't come back out. That's pretty much what he tells them. Now, the same thing ends up happening in to, the, to the Jews that came back into Jerusalem. In the first generation that they were there, they go, they go into idolatry, they go into whoredoms, they marry a bunch of strange wives. God takes them into captivity. They're in Babylon. God miraculously brings them back. They come back. They rebuild the wall. They rebuild the temple. And within that first generation, they do it all over again. They do the same exact thing that got them where they were at in the first place. Look at verse number one. Now, when these things were done, the princes came to me as we're speaking, saying, The people of Israel, the priest, and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands. Look at this. Doing according to the abominations. Now it's going to name, it's always this list of people that really shouldn't have even been alive. They should have been wiped off the face of the earth a long time ago. But they're still just hanging around. Look at this. From the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Jebusites, and the Ammonites, and the Moabites, and the Egyptians, and the Amorites, for they have taken their daughters for themselves and, their, for, and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of the land. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers have been chief in the trespass. Everybody was marrying the heathen, not just some of the common folk, not just some of the regular people, but everybody from the top down went in and they came into the land. They saw these, they saw the beautiful women. They saw these great looking guys and they married them. Now go, go in your Bibles here in Ezra chapter nine. Look at verse number three. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle and I plucked off the hair of my head and my beard and sat, sat down to Stani. So they come to Ezra and they say, look, Ezra, everybody, they did the same exact thing. They married all these women from the land that were already here, these heathens. And they gave their daughters over to marry their sons. And they, they, they married a bunch of heathen. Now they all have children that are half heathen, they're probably full heathen. They probably don't even worship the Lord God. Right. And yeah. he comes in, and this is not, again, I'll say this because it needs to be said. Is, this is not saying that, that, that black people shouldn't marry white people or that white people shouldn't marry Asian people. Asian people always get this free pass. It's like whenever like blacks aren't a lot or Mexicans are a lot of very white people, it's like, what about Asians? Oh, they're okay. You know, it's like, <laughs> I don't know what that is. You know what I mean? But I'll tell you this, this had nothing to do with race. It had everything to do with religion. Yeah. It's not that they got mad and said, oh, you guys are white people. And look, hey, the Jews were not white people in this day. Okay, my friend, they're in the Middle East. They're brown. And he said, that it's not because that you married black people or you married white people or you married brown people. It had nothing to do with the skin color or nationality. It had everything to do with religion. They were heathens. Yes. They did not worship the Lord God. They did all sorts of wicked things. If you look up that list of the Jebusites, Ammonites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Moabites, Egyptians, Amorites, all these people were super evil and wicked people that offered their sons and daughters up to false gods, that, that, com that committed bestiality, that committed sodomy, that committed all these other abominable works. The Bible says that's what God warned them in the book of Deuteronomy to avoid. Don't mix among the heathen because if you mix among the heathen, you're going to end up doing the same thing as the heathen. And God drove those people out from a month before you because of what they did, because of the gods they served. And if you end up doing the same thing, the same thing's going gonna to drive you out of the land. And that's what he told them. Now look at verse number three. And so when he heard what they had done, the Bible says that Ezra he literally started ripping his hair out of his head, the beard off of his own face. He ripped his clothes and he fell down and he sat down astonished. Like he, the thousand yard stare. He sat there like, what have they done? They took us into bondage. Millions of them were probably killed. They were probably raped and abused by the Babylonians that came in that attacked them. They were being bombarded where women were eating their own children. They were eating their own babies. Yep. They were being starved to death. They got taken and all sorts of horrible things happened because of what they'd done. In the same exact generation, they're doing the same thing. And you know what Ezra said? He said, whoa, woe is us. He knew it was coming. He knew they were done. He knew that, the, man, what they're doing right now, we're getting ready to relive it all over again. We thought God had bring us and he delivered us and he did. But it was conditional. Look at verse number four. 
Then were assembled unto me everyone that trembled at the word of the words of the God of Israel. So he starts, they're thinking, uh-oh, what have we done? And because of the transgression of those that had been carried away, and I sat down astonished until the evening sacrifice. He literally sat there just silent. Just sat there. Couldn't believe what had happened. Look at verse number six. And said, oh my God, I am ashamed and blushed to lift up my face unto thee, my God. For our iniquities are increased over our head. And our trespass is grown up to the heavens. Look at verse 10. And now, oh our God, we, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments, which thou hast commanded by thy servants, the prophets, saying, The land unto which ye go in to possess it is an unclean land with filthiness of the people of the land. And with their abominations, which have filled it from one end to the other with their uncleanness. He's saying, look, you warned us. Look at verse 12. Now, therefore, the one command that God told them not to do. You know, like it's like God just said, don't eat the, the fruit of the one tree. Don't do this. Don't do this thing. Because if you do it, it's going to, it's, you're going to end up on earth, on, a, on an earthly meaning, you're going to end up damning your entire nation. Look at verse number 12, uh, 12. Now, therefore, give not your daughters unto their sons. Neither take their daughters to your sons, nor seek the peace of their wealth forever, that ye may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance for your children. He said if they would have just kept separate, if they wouldn't have been you know, clean plus unclean, they could have had this land and left it to their children for an inheritance. But look at verse number 13. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds, and after everything that we have done and God has punished us, every single thing that he has done to us, Look at this. And for our great trespass, seeing that thou our God hast punished us less than our iniquities deserve, and hast given us such deliverances unto this. So he's saying, <clears throat> when we got taken into captivity into Babylon, Ezra's saying, we deserved worse than that. Yeah. We deserve to be done away with. We did, we went so contrary to what you told us to do, we all deserve to just be killed. We all deserve to be done away with. He's saying, you punished us severely, but it wasn't even as severe as it should have been. Look at verse number 14. Should we again break thy commandments to join affinity with the people of these abominations? Wouldst not thou be angry with us till thou hast consumed us, so that there should be no remnant nor escaping? Go to Ezra chapter 10. Go, go forward one more chapter. So he's pleading to God, and he pretty much, you know what he's saying? The Lord, do, I don't know what to tell you. He's saying, Lord, I know what we deserve. I know what we should have coming. I know that we should be destroyed from off the face of the earth. I know that. And it's almost like he's, they've done so wickedly, he like feels bad even asking God to forgive him. I mean, it's like, we've done so bad. I just, we just need it. These people are so rebellious. These people are so stubborn. These people are so hard-hearted. These people are so wicked. I, I don't even want them to go out without punishment. I want them to be punished. I know that means that I have to be punished, but that's what we deserve. Look at verse number two. Then Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra. So the people come to Ezra and said, look, we devised the plan. This is what we're going to have to do. This is our last ditch effort to keep God from taking us back into bondage. We have trespassed against our God and have taken strange wives of the people of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. Now, therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives as such as are born unto them. According to the counsel of my Lord, and of those that tremble at the commandment of our God, let it be done according to the law. Arise, for this manner belongeth unto thee. We will also be, will be with thee. Be of good courage and do it. So they come to Ezra and say, this is what we're going to do. Is everybody that's, every guy that has a wife and their children, we're just going to, we're going to, we're going to force all the, the wives and children. Not just the wives, the, every, the children, everybody to just leave. We're going to force them to move. And get out of the land. Look at verse number 11. Now therefore make confession unto the Lord the God of your fathers. And do his pleasure. And separate yourselves from the people of the land. And from the strange wives. Then all the congregation answered and said with a loud voice. As thou hast said. So we must do. So must we do. There were so many people that married strange wives. They had to do it in waves. If you read the story in Ezra. They had to bring so many people one day. Because it was raining. And so they had to bring so many people one day, and they had to do it, and they had to give them several days. To, I mean, that's so many people of the land had married these strangers. 
You say, well, does that mean that if I'm married to an unsaved person or if there's someone, if I have friends married to an unsaved person, that they should get rid of them? No, not at all. The Bible condemns divorce. The Bible condemns divorce and remarriage. The Bible forbids it. What this is saying is there were drastic measures that these people were doing so that way they didn't end up being taken back into captivity. He's saying, look, we put away our wives, we put away our children, and that may even be a sin. But that sin is, nothing, is not greater than letting these people infect this whole entire nation full of abomination and filthiness. He even talks about them being filthy. Now go in your Bibles to Matthew chapter number 10. Matthew chapter number 10. God was merciful and bring them back in after one generation. You say, what in the world? Like, how do we apply that to us today? Well, we need to be fearless. We need to be strong. We need to have good courage. We also need to get this, the sin out of our life. And God looks at sin in our life as there's nothing that's really that small. You think of one guy out of a million people or how many people went into the promised land? One guy took one wedge of gold, one, a couple garments, and God killed 32 people and would have stayed the whole country because of that one man's sin. God looked down and these people had taken wives and they had, may have had children, and, and the Bible says that Ezra, now God didn't tell them to do this, but this is what they did. Because it was a last ditch effort to try to keep God from taking them into captivity. Saying, we have no idea what to do here. We have buried ourselves in a hole. Our iniquity is above our heads. We are like, we are in a pit of iniquity. We have no idea what to do. This is the best thing that they can come up with. They did it. But did it work? No. Because what happened then? They just got taken over by the Romans, and they went back into, they were scattered abroad throughout for the rest of history. Because they're evil and wicked people. They're rebellious people. They were stubborn. They were hard-hearted. See, how does that apply to us? Well, if you want to be blessed by God, and you want to be a part, and we want to be a part, Steadfast Baptist Church wants to be a part of this movement, the last push, you know, for the next generation, and if we want to leave an inheritance for, if we don't want to be reading one day, you have some preacher get up, instead of reading B.R. Lakin and you know Lester Roloff and 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 Jack and all these people, and nobody knows what church they came from, they say Stephen Anderson, Donnie Romero, Roger Jimenez, and people have heard these names. They have no idea their churches are not in existence. If they are, they've all gone liberal. If we don't want that to happen. We individually have to make a choice that we are not going to let sin into the camp. I can't go around and nor should I go around and police everybody. You have to police yourself. Because if we do that, we will. If the Lord don't come in our lifetime, then we can leave an inheritance to our children. And our children, Silas P. and all the other little kids, will all rise up and they'll be fire-breathing, leather-long Baptist preachers themselves. But if we let sin in the camp, they'll go liberal. They'll learn the way of the heathen, and that's what they'll end up doing. And then Steadfast Baptist Church hopefully will change the name because it'll have not been Steadfast anymore, and it'll be Steadfast Community Church. <laughs> and it'll be st- yeah. st- Do you know what's funny? This morning I mentioned about Paul Chapel and Lancaster Baptist Church, oh. about, about every sermon is about grace. We went on their YouTube channel. Go on their YouTube channel. Yeah, it is. Look at their last 25 sermons. I'm not kidding you. 18 of them are about grace. They have grace in the title. (laughs) Do you know what? That old temple, it may have looked beautiful, but it went into sin. It fell. And God is raising up a new temple. The Bible says in Luke 9, 62, Jesus said, No man having put his hand to the plow looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. We're not looking back at yesteryear. Look, if they did great things, hey, let's put that behind us. That's great. Forgetting those things which are behind. Reaching forth into those things which are before. Amen. I press toward the mark. The mark is still before us. It's in front of us. It's not behind us. I'm not sitting there looking back and hoping we can accomplish what they accomplished a long time ago. I'm looking to do new things. I'm looking to do greater things. Jesus said about his disciples that the works that I do, that you shall do greater. Look at verse number 34. Matthew 10, 34. Think not that I am come to send peace on an earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. So how do I apply this today? Well, 2017, you want to do great things for God. You cannot be entangled with the affairs of this world. There should be nothing 
that you should have. There's, look, I was talking with a preacher whose dad has gone, whose dad is also a preacher that's gone in the way of the, totally in the way of the world. And the son does not support his father. And he said, he said that Bible truth trumps relationships. Amen. Bible Amen. truth trumps, it doesn't matter. Bible tr truth trumps earthly relationships. Right. And that's the truth. You know, I'm not saying that, you know, you have to go out and just, you know, all your families then say spit in their face and, you know, be mean to them. But I'm saying this, there's nothing that you should be willing to give up to, to serve the Lord. And you guys that want to be pastors and want to be preachers one day, you have to get this in your head. You know, let's face it, you're going to be the leader of a cult. <laughs> That's what they say anyway. You know what I mean? They're like, oh, you guys are, you are I remember one time when I went to Landmark. This lady that came visit, she's like, I've seen you guys for like three years. I live down the road. And you guys always wear shirts and ties. She goes, I just assumed you guys were a cult because you wear shirts and ties. <laughs> and all the ladies wear dresses. I'm like, what? Look at Matthew 19. Go to Matthew 19. The Bible says if you don't take your cross and follow after him, you're not worthy of him. you got to be willing to give some things up. There's got to be some things that you're willing to sacrifice. Amen. There's got to be some things that you're willing to, to give up in order to, to serve God. You say, I don't want to, you know, well... I really, you know, like this or that or the other thing. Well, you might have to give that up. I really like all my sports that I play. I really like all the video games. I really like the television. I really like these things. Well, if you want to serve God and you want to get sin out of your life, you're going to have to sever those things off. Because a little leaven leaven it the whole lump. And a little bit of sin in the camp can hinder this church from leaving an inheritance for our children. Look, sin in your life or sin in my life can hinder your children's inheritance. If I go into sin, I can hinder your children's future. You go into sin, you can hinder my children's future. That's what the Bible says. We need to individually make and say, well, you know what? I'm going to make sure that I'm living for God. We are going to make. What did Joshua say before he died? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You guys go serve them if you want. You go watch Hollywood. You go watch the television. You go do all these wicked on, things. Now. You go drink your booze. Yeah. You go do all your other garbage. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve God. Yeah. As for me and my house, my eyes will be upon the faithful of the land. Yeah. I'm not going to do that. Why? Because I want to be separate. I want to be holy unto the Lord. I want to serve God. Was Look at verse 29. And everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children... Or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. He's saying, you're going to not only be saved, but you're also just going to inherit a hundredfold of anything that you can give up. God will replace it. God will bless you. You say, well, you know, if I, look, I'll give you a good example and then we'll be done. I had a great job in Colorado working in the oil field, but I wanted to serve God. So I moved to Arizona. They don't have the oil field in Arizona. They don't exist out there. They don't, they don't do that. They have the coal mine, but you have to just be literally gone. Like, you can't do it. You can't do it. So I had to go from making real good money to no good money. Not, I don't care. Woe is me, you know, whatever. But, but that's a, that was something I was willing to do. Why? Because I wanted to serve God with my life. And I even said, look, if I'm never a pastor, I'm still going to serve God with my life. Even if you never pastor a church, you are still benefiting this church. You're benefiting the kingdom by serving God with your life here at this church. Say, well, if I can't pastor a church, I feel like my life is over. No. You serve here now, right. but it doesn't work unless you're here now, right. unless you stay here now, unless you make sure and you say, look, I'm not going to get disgruntled. I'm not going to get offended. I'm going to make sure that I'm serving God and I will sacrifice and give up the, the, the comedies I like to make sure that my children, that I'm leaving them an inheritance, that if this is not the final push in our generation, it's coming soon. I mean, how much worse can the world get? It's going to come in our children, our grandbabies. I want to make sure that my grandson is just on fire, hardcore Baptist preacher. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the word of God. Lord, thank you for this weekend and all the souls that got saved. I pray, Lord, that you will uh, put it on their heart, Lord, to want to grow and help them to desire the milk of the word, Lord, and help them to get into church. Help us to run across people, Lord, and that have been saved already and that we have gotten saved. Help us to come across them again and really uh, just press their heart to come to church. I'm going to pray, Lord, for the people that are around this world, especially around this country, that have a desire, Lord, to be a part of this movement, that they would uh, forsake whatever they have to, Lord, to be a part of it and move to a good church, Lord, where they can serve you, Lord, 
and put themselves in a position where they can leave an inheritance to their children. Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you for everything that you do for us, Lord. You're, 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 you're very good to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.